um, I can I can say because I was of the material world, and when I first saw my first teacher Derek Island, I was uh, through my senses drawn to how amazing he looked, the energy that he expressed, and uh, through that expression, I wanted to feel like him. I wanted to be like him, and through practicing with Derek, I connected to the breath, and then the breath takes you back into you, to that connection to you. Um, and so, let's say we're all we're all on a spiritual journey. We get confused by the material world. There's too many things, this or that, this or that, and so we get caught up in the duality of life. But underneath the current of this creative force wants to connect you back to that non-dual that you are connected to everything. And so the, 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 if you connect to that life force, it pulls you in, it pulls you in. So rather, so what I'm saying now, my, my, my station of life is I've retired from the world to be in the world, to not be a product of the world, but to enhance the world. It's a, it's a subtle difference by being a product of the world that you go outside of yourself, falling out of yourself, and then compromising to the world. When you come back inside, you fall back into yourself, and there's no compromise. You are who you are. And so I think that the draw to yoga is we're always wanting to know who we are. We might find it in a search in a sport or a job or a, or a partner and we, we're going out in that relationship to find who we are but the biggest relationship to find who you are is the relationship with yourself yes and no yes it is a physical activity no it's not let's look at it that uh, there's many windows or doors of perception there's physical outside doors, like the door to your office, the door to your bedroom, the door to outside. And we can move from one space to another space. Yeah. And so for some of us, the label on the door might be health and fitness. The label on the door might be um, Instagram. <laughs> You know, the label's there, but it, once you go through the door, then you're into a different realm, into a different, in, into a different state of consciousness. And so uh, for some of us, for me, yes, the door that I went through into yoga was a physical door. But that was, what, now, who, what, what is this choice? Who's making the choice? Is it your soul making the choice or is it your ego making the choice? So there's this sort of this 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 little interplay between consciousness, soul, ego, desire, and so there's something greater that's driving you through, taking you through the right door. So, for example, favorite movie, uh, The Matrix, Morpheus says to Neo, Neo, I can take you to the door, but you have to walk through. But the thing is, it's, it's knowing which door to go through. When you go through the physical door, then you start to realize there's doors inside your mind. Windows with inside your mind, your field of perception is programmed, programmed. And until you open that door and release that program, you can get through to another state of consciousness. So now let's have a look at the other metaphor of door. Door closes you from a space. We've had many doors that have closed us into a material world. And so yoga is to open those doors so there is no door. Eventually there is no door. There is no wall. There is no window. Yeah. So, so yes, there, it, 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 for, for some it's a very physical beginning. And for some they're already there. Uh, but when you, when you finally get there, then you start to realize that even this is a yoga. The, the, the yoga is, can you commune in union? 
speak, be heard, and listen and return backwards and forwards. That's why an interview goes really well if you're not a politician. <laughs> if you're a politician, you don't answer the question. But here we can answer the question. We can be transparent. Yeah, full transparency. Politicians aren't transparent. Yogis are transparent. Because the doors, the walls, the windows have all been taken down. Well, we are embodied. We've, we've come into this physical 3D realm, into this physical 3D body. And so, in other words, to actually arrive, okay, so how many dimensions are there? One, two, three, four, five. How many dimensions? There's many dimensions. And most people live in a one-dimensional world. Some a two-dimensional world. And let's say a one-dimensional world is they don't even know they are breathing. The autonomic nervous system is breathing them. God is breathing them. So how do we connect to that spirit, that, that inspiration, that Einatman, Ausatman, whatever language you're in there, it refers to life force or spirit, that breath. So the key element of yoga is the channel of the breath is the connection to, to energy. Now, it could be on a windsurfer, it could be on a wave, it could be climbing a rock, that you are brought to this place where you are connecting to the fact that you have to breathe. Yeah, because breath is life. Like a yacht has a keel and a rudder. And so for me, I found Derek and Derek took me straight to Patabi Joyce. So I entered yoga straight into Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. And I then went straight to Patabi Joyce. So my, my keel was set. Of course, if you start with Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, immediately then there is Iyengar Yoga. There's the, there was at that particular time, the two big names were Patabi Joyce and Mr. Iyengar. And there was different styles then. So you were aware of those. Um, I guess because I had such a strong keel in the Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, a strong root from the beginning, uh, like the wind, the sails on a boat, you can go this way, you can go that way, but your keel is still taking you, yeah? So yes, I, I, I did not close my eyes to what was out there. I had uh, have experienced a little bit of Iyengar, but it was never to shift. It was never to shift from one to another because my, my root, my keel was so, so secure that I was just able to go, okay, because my father was one of my first teachers and my father gave me a mantra and the mantra that he gave me was, Johnny, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. So there's more than one way to do yoga. Yeah, and so what we what we don't want to do is to become misidentified or labelled. So, um, yes, my root is Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. The principles I follow the principles and the method of Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, but I don't follow what's the doctrine out there now. There's a doctrine out there that it's first series, second series, this, this, this. For me, I'm a man of principle. What is the principle of yoga? What is the principle of Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga? What is the method? And then, then, then you're free. Because yoga is not to bind you. Yoga is to free you. So, yes, I've observed other methods, but I, I was content, very content, and very, very secure, very happy within Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. At the very beginning, six days a week, non-stop. Uh, with Guruji, going every year going back to Guruji, he was uh, always um, 
putting energy into you. And if you went back and you had slipped, he would be he would be cross. Because the energy he had put into you, you had wasted. So at the beginning, it was like going up. Uh, he was also uh, teaching in the sense that Mysore was the teacher training. There was no teacher training. He was wanting those young people to learn everything and not necessary to give students everything, but to understand what to give, when to give, how to give, but wanted us to experience everything. And so, yes, uh, we would only have Saturday off, full moon off, dark moon off, travel days off. So for the first uh, 15, 20 years, it was very religious, very ritual, very repetitive, very consistent. Um, and let's say it's a little bit like investment. So Guruji would say that prana and money, money was outside prana. Um, and so let's say your practice is like prana and just as you can invest your outside prana, you can invest your inside prana. So all those years of repetitive work, repetitive work has put me in a place now where my practice is minimal. It's a, what I would call a, just a maintenance practice, but I do practice each morning. I haven't practiced the traditional practice this morning. I've done some breath and some spinal movements before connecting with you. Today, you and this conversation is my yoga. Then when you start to realize that there's a length to the breath, a width to the breath, and a depth to the breath, then you realize that you've arrived in a physical body, a three-dimensional body, in a three-dimensional space around you. So then you start to realize you're a, you are space. You're a, you, you occupy space. So if we then get to the fourth dimension, which is time, space-time continuum, you're a space-time continuum. How do we get to that fourth dimension? So from the first dimension of not being breath awareness, second dimension being where that you breathe in and out. Each exhalation is a death, each inhalation is a birth. When you then start to realize that it's not just a birth and a death, it's a full, it's a blossom. There's three dimensions to it, which is part of this three-dimensional realm. When you start to engage with that, then there's another door. <laughs> and that other door through that physical realm goes, okay, now I'm energy. I'm occupying space, I'm energy and time. So you've, you, to arrive in this consciousness, you've had to go through, basically one, two, three, you have to go through building blocks, arriving in the physical. That's what we've come. We chose here to have this physical experience. And now we then interrelate. This is what Pratyahara is. Pratyahara is to go out through the sense of hearing, connecting with space, through the breath, the sense of touch, air, connecting to air, sight, light and fire, taste is the water, and smell is really connecting to the earth. So we've been given these five senses to really interconnect with what this 3D realm is. And so yes, the physical is really important. Now as I age, I still want to be able to sit down on the earth and stand up from the earth, not be reliant on on a chair, yeah? I still want to be independent in my movement and my connection to earth. And that connection to earth is gravity. So we also then learn between breath and gravity. These are the two forces that we arrive with. Mum is carrying us in the womb. We're in water. She's breathing us. When we're birthed, we have to breathe for ourselves. And then we have to support ourselves. And you'll then discover that the exhalation is the surrender into earth. And the inhalation is receiving the, the strength to stand on the earth. It's a beautiful relationship. 
And here it is here, the trees, the trees here are, provide, are providing that breath. And so, yes, you, it's a beautiful journey to go non-aware of this body, to being aware of the body, to realizing it is your vehicle for this life. It is your temple for this life. So yes, it must be sprung, spring cleaned. It must be maintained. But you want to make sure that that maintenance program is not a program that's going to wear it out. Yeah? By doing too much. Uh, code within the eight limbs, Ashtanga, is Yama. And within Yama, the first one is Ahimsa. And Ahimsa means to be non-violent. That's the translation we're given. For me, uh, ahimsa is to love the self. So if we if we start by loving the self, then you realize that there's so many people that need to know that. So what it is when you love yourself, you you have your own dominion and your own sovereignty. And so Guruji was always saying mind control. Yoga is mind control. What happens is we acquiesce and we give our power away to the outside world, to outside bodies of control. And so my mission as a yoga practitioner and a yoga teacher is to find sovereignty. The sovereign that I say yes to life by saying no to you, the system. Yeah? The system is trying to control everybody in the material world. Yeah, and so what's important is for everyone to realize that they have their own sovereign. There is no, there is no borders, boundaries. There is no flag, Marco. Love has no flag. There is no flag. That's why you and I can can commune together because I don't consider you Italian and you don't consider me New Zealand. If we've already transcended that. We're, we are kindred spirits. And what does a kindred spirit mean? A kindred spirit is a spirit that's looking for the same thing. You've identified you're also looking for love. And, the, and, and then through our connection, I can say, just gently stare a little bit, the love's in you, Marco. Look at you, look at that beautiful smile. Yeah, and, but it's this, and this is this is yeah. So the big question, Marco. Yes, definitely is why, how. So even yesterday, I was going, why is there so much negativity? How do we change that negativity? And the only way we can do it is within ourselves. Set the example. But when the pressure comes to the push, say no. I don't support it. Yeah. For example, the whole COVID thing, I did not support it. Uh, one of my favorite books would be um, How Yoga Works by Geshe Michael Roach. And it's a beautiful story, Miss, Miss Friday, a little Tibetan girl, uh, her journey. And she's talking about her teacher and she's talking about the guru or the teacher being a vessel. And so, for example, Patabi Joyce was a vessel that through Patabi Joyce, information came. So I've become a vessel. I'm a vessel. I'm a vessel for information to flow through, to share. Um, we are all, at the same time, ordinary people. Most of the times we're caught up in the ordinary, non-focused state. When we become focused, then things flow through you. They flow through you. So, for example, building this, I accept I don't know what I'm doing. But if I stay focused on what I want to achieve, then it flows through. Yeah? And so to answer your question, 
in terms of students or other people, other yogis, it's to to um, share this that there is sovereignty, there is dominion. You have the right to say yes or no to life the way you want to have it. And then that way you then connect to that God force that I'm talking about. You realize you're a creator. And then you through your yoga. So the yoga is not the, the product, the end goal. Through my yoga, I've connected to that creative energy. If you're a singer, this, that, that becomes your yoga. If you're a climber, that becomes your yoga. If you're a scientist, that's your yoga. So everybody needs a yoga practice, which we, we call it the sadhana. A sadhana is that which you do ritualistically daily that brings you to you each day. Brings you back to you each day, back to your root, you nourish your root so that you're able then to create your day. If you don't bring yourself to that point, this is what full vinyasa is. Full vinyasa is to take yourself to samastadihi, and samastadihi is zero. Zero, it's shunyata. From zero, so each morning when you come to stillness to a still point, from that zero point, there is no past, there is no future, there's just now. From that now, you can say, okay, what am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with this moment? And, and, and the options are limitless. Very simple, don't add them together. The ordinary thinking mind is tricked by the equation. And so we go 99% practice, 1% theory, 99 plus 1% equals 100%. That's the ordinary thinking mind, makes that miscalculation. Theory and practice have nothing in common. <laughs> okay, so let's just make it like apples and bananas. 99 apples plus one banana. You'll always have 99 apples and one banana. You'll have a hundred fruits. So this question really baffled me. I had to contemplate and contemplate and contemplate. Guruji would say, leg, you. Straight, John. So if you, he would say it backwards. He, if you go, Shanka Chakra Asi Darinam. Shanka Chakra Asi Darinam. Darinam is holding a sword, a chakra, and a conch. That sutra is actually translated backwards. Let's translate this sutra backwards. Take 1% theory and practice at 99%. Now that raises more questions. We can understand why only 99% practice. Well, most of us Westerners practice 110%. Beautiful. Thank you, Julia. We practice 110%. We practice for others, for the ego, for the father, for the teacher. For, for the Instagram, we practice 100%, 110%, attached to the goal, attached to getting better and better, yeah? And so take Eckhart Tolle, in his book, The New, New Earth, there's one sentence that says, there was a time when there was no flowers, no flowers on, on this big rock. <laughs> and when the conditions were right, and the time was right, Overnight, flowers appeared. Not one, but flowers. So this was like a quantum leap in evolution. So I take, I take um, Guruji and I take Eckhart Tolle and I put them together. Take 1% theory. Practice it, practice it, practice it. 99%. What? Well, hang on. 99%, there's a missing 1%. There's a missing 1%.
because 1% theory is 1% of infinite amount of theory. But specifically saying 99% practice, there's a missing 1%. To, uh, to Chuck Miller, he said 95% practice, 5% theory. So Chuck and I would have a little joke with one another that he could ha he could handle more academic work than me. I was more of a Nike man, just do it, just do it. So, but then what I realized was no, the 1%, the missing 1%. Guruji's always saying, free breathing, free breathing, relax, free breathing. He's adjusting you. He's taking you to your edge and he's saying, relax, relax. He didn't use the word surrender. I then translated it to surrender. So when you practice a technique, a technique, so to jump through, to jump through on sub to seven, there's many, there's many one percent theory. Flat hands, armpit bandha, uriana bandha, the breath, the drishti, the, all of that. All of those one percents have to come together. So with Eckhart Tolle, when the conditions are set, meaning when all of the technique has prepared the conditions and come into the line into alignment. This is real alignment. When you surrender to the outcome, by the grace of God, you jump through. Now, when you jump through, it's beyond word, Marco. It's beyond word. The moment we put the word to the description of it, it's made it smaller. It's made it less. So practice, practice, practice. 99% practice, 1% theory. Practice, practice, practice. Do your practice, do your practice, and all is coming. So it's a bigger, it's a bigger, it's, it's a bigger uh, quote. But the ordinary thinking mind gets stuck on the equation 99 plus 1. That's incorrect mathematics. As an Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga practitioner and teacher, um, my Guruji gave me counted method. So the sutras that he gave me, yoga is mind control through a breathing system. That breathing system is counted method. That counted method is a tristana, a trifocus of mind, breath, body, and that is vinyasa. Do you get that order? So I like to put things in order. It's it, yoga is mind, and that's what you're talking about. That was your question about where your mind is. It's through a breathing system. So this is the hardest thing for people to accept. It's about the breath, not the body. Each time you exhale, you're surrendering. Each time you exhale, you're letting go. Now, to get the quality inhale, you need to be able to exhale. And this is where we then bring in the bandha. We need the bandha to get the breathing system working properly. So bandha is body. Bandha and body are one. Yeah? We need that body connection to be grounded to the earth, to be stable, to get that complete exhalation to get the inhalation. Now Guruji was always saying free breathing, free breathing, free breathing. He also said Ujjayi. Ujjayi is only in the state of the asana. So when you're, when you're arrived in your position, then we look for equal inhalation, exhalation. While we're dynamically moving, it's free breathing. And the inhalation, exhalation can be very expressive. The inhalation can be dynamic. And, and, and different length, different force to the exhalation. For example, chitwari is a different exhalation to supta the inhale. Or trini, the inhale before you jump back on chitwari, that inhale is so important to get the exhale. So what the biggest challenge is to get past the body our ego wants our body to be doing the posture correct but what is correct asana for you right now, irrespective of how long the hamstrings are, how, how open the hips are, it's whether you're able to get free breathing. 
Because if the breath is stuck, if the breath is challenged, if the breath is stiff, Guruji would say, oh, stiff body, stiff mind. So it, the bo it, the, the, and the bridge between that body and that mind is the breath. So now he says counted methods. So what, I'm de what I've developed more than what Guruji passed is that I'm actually teaching people to count. Ekam inhale, dwe exhale. Trini inhale, chatwari exhale. So first comes the mantra. I call it mantra. Mantra is for mind. Mantra. Man is manas mind. Now it's the manas mind that went 99% plus 1% equals 100. We want to understand that within mind in the, in the yoga system, there's consciousness, chit. Then there's buddhi. Buddhi is intelligence. And then there's manas. Manas is the impressionable part of the mind. And then there's the ahamkara. Now the ahamkara translates in the Western psychology to ego. That's what's different between you and I is our ahamkara. That which makes you Marco and that which makes me Johnny. Now the programming of that is what we're dealing with. If you're able to say, no, I'm going to discipline my ahamkara to focus in on the sutra, mind, breathing, yeah, counted, tristana, we keep that flowing, then we're not putting all of our energies into the body, getting stuck in the body and then being disappointed with ourselves, challenged by ourselves. So to be content is to be just free in that breathing, free breathing. Breath is free. It is the only thing that we have. And so after the 30 plus years of, of yoga, what is the most important thing I've learned is no matter whether I'm practicing, walking, working in the garden, whatever I'm doing, I'm aware of that breath. It's taken a long time to become aware of my breathing all the time. The most difficult thing is to be really aware of your breath while you're talking. Because we talk on the exhalation. And most people then breathe through the mouth on the inhalation while talking. Uh, I was... Uh, absolutely excited and nervous all at the same time. Um, it was Derek that said you must come to 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 uh, Mysore if you really want to do this yoga. Come to Mysore and be a student of Patabi Joyce. I before I went to Mysore, I met Graham Northfield, an Australian guy, and he said, "Are you ready?" He said, "It's intense. It's very intense." And so I went understanding that it was going to be quite intense. When I got there, I was welcomed by a beautiful, open face, smile, welcoming face from Guruji. Asked me straight away, who was my teacher? So he wanted to know that connection. And then he said, you come tomorrow morning. And he told me what time to come and you watch. So my first day was sitting and watching. So there was enough space in the shala to sit so uh, there was 24 people there was three batches of of eight people so in the shala at one time there was eight people which meant there was room to sit and so on my first day i sat and just watched and you, before you reached the shala you could hear the sound of the breath when you got into the shala you could feel the the heat the moisture and um the energy was very intense. Uh, Guruji was quite strict, but also had uh, little jokes. He would have little anticlimaxes. Um, and so on my first day, uh, the next day practicing, uh, because I had done some yoga with Derek, um, I sort of knew what I was doing, but because there was only eight in the room, um, Guruji was right with me. And... Uh, uh, I got to Pasvottanasana, the first, the end of the first six basic asana, and then he told me to take Padmasana. 
So my first practice was only 20 minutes with him. And it was intense. And from, from that day onwards, he then took me posture by posture. Now, when there was only eight people in the class, uh, that was very special. And on that first visit, because uh, it, this is back in, you know, as I said, back in 89, um, it wasn't so popular. And Guruji was also going to America. Um, the three months that I had there, the last month, there was only there was only four of us there. So it went from 24 people down to four people. And so that was very special to have that um, that that one-to-one -one connection with Guruji.